number 115, Love Lifted Me. We're going to sing all three verses of this one as well. Hymn number 115. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, earth might as very cry. Good hell. 
on the last verse. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, but that will not be our final text. We will be moving into chapter 12. Jesus' message to the Pharisees and lawyers had been rather tough. He'd been invited to a home, and then in the midst of it, the host began to criticize him because he had not followed ceremonial washings of the Pharisees before he ate. The Lord did not then hold back, pointing out their phoniness and their unreasonable demands upon the common everyday Jewish person. Hypocrites was the term that he used. Now, there was not uh, what we would expect, a, a great amount of grief and sorrowing over these tough remarks that the Lord was making. Instead, there was indignation and anger as the Lord poured out His righteous condemnation against their sin-hardened hearts. It was woe to them because of their rigid uh, observance of the tithe, which was okay, but they had uh, overlooked the greater things of God and the love of God and justice toward others. Uh, Woe to them for their love of attention and praise from men. Woe to them for their outward righteousness. They had grand appearance, but inwardly they were filled with wickedness. Woe to the religious lawyers because they had added so much to God's law that they had made it an unwieldy burden for the normal people. And then not only was it too much for anybody to bear, but the lawyers did nothing to try to help them to understand all these additions that they had given them. Woe to them for their pretended honor, building great mausoleums for the prophets that their fathers had killed. Woe to those who refused to go through the door of knowing God and then who worked to keep others out of that door as well. Now I want you to notice, we did not look at this last week, but I want you to notice the last two verses of chapter 11 and note the response. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. They were enraged and they tried to attack him from all sides. I tried to think what this must have been like. It it was like um, the Lord speaking to a... uh, a very unsympathetic crowd, and they begin to heckle him and begin to challenge him and begin to cry out to him and begin to uh, try to get him to maybe uh, lose his cool and say something that they could use against him. You see, to them, this was an urgent mission. They could not afford to fail. Jesus must be stopped. Well, the fact of the matter is, the mealtime at the Pharisee's house had turned into quite a large and heated debate. And because these meals, as we've discovered in the past, oftentimes was in a large home and they became rather public affairs, news of what was taking place at the mealtime quickly spread outside and up down the streets and, and soon people began to gather around the house trying to fill up the street and the crowd trying to get in just so they could maybe hear what was going on or get a glimpse of all the excitement. 
chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Notice that expression, innumerable multitude. Now, this was in town somewhere, and so it wasn't the open spaces where they would come and sit orderly on a hillside. No, they were jamming into the narrow streets trying to get to this house, trying to find out what was going on, so much so that they were, you know, stepping on one another. There was pushing and shoving, and it was really becoming a bit dangerous. And so I see the Lord leaving the Pharisee's house, getting out into the midst of this crowd. And it's in this tumultuous setting that the Lord Jesus begins to instruct his disciples. Now, not everybody's going to grasp the truth that he was going to say, but if he could get his followers to understand some warnings, uh, there would be some hope for them and for those who would follow in their footsteps. Now, there are several brief lessons in our text this morning, and the Lord speaks them in a rather blunt fashion, and they deal with our actions, our attitudes, and our affection. You know, today we live in very, very unsettled times. Times of growing wickedness when it seems really at times, I don't know, it just feels like all that is righteous is about ready to be swept away and gone. So how shall we live? How should we respond? Do we run and hide? Do we no longer care for truth? Do we no longer care for those who need to hear the truth? Tough questions. But as always, the Lord Jesus, God the Son, has words of hope and challenge and promise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for another Lord's Day that we can come and gather together as uh, your people, uh, an assembly of your people. Lord, we're so glad for each one that is here. And uh, Lord, we pray that as we come to the word of God, that Lord, you would empower it by your spirit. Lord, I, I really have nothing that I can offer. It has to come from you and it has to be driven home by your power. And so Lord, I, I pray that as we look at these brief statements that you make, that, Lord, we'll, we'll be open and ready to hear them and to understand the truth that you're trying to get across to us in really these perilous days in which we live. So, Lord, uh, please help us today, and may you receive all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. For it's in your name we ask these things. Amen. I want you to notice in verse number one uh, the idea of integrity. And they were gathered together, innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon the other. Look at the last part here. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, remember, disciples are followers, not just the twelve. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, we've often talked about leaven, so I don't want to spend a great deal of time, but in in the Bible, when you find leaven being used, and that's yeast, if you're not certain what leaven is, it's yeast. Leaven is always used as a picture of sin. And the reason being is that when, when uh, you make bread and you decide it, you want leavened bread, and most of us like leavened bread, we like its fluffiness, and most bread you buy has that, but you put a little bit of leaven in it, and it begins to work its way through the dough and eventually permeates all of that dough, and sometimes you knead it and punch it down a little bit, and then it leavens up again and makes the bread nice and fluffy. But it really is simply used, not that there's anything sinful about leaven, but the leaven, the way that it works starting small and increasing and eventually filling all of that dough, it's a picture of how sin works. You know, sin never, you know, suddenly, boom, somebody's engaged in some horrendous iniquity. It always begins small, always begins in a little place, always, you know, 
it always has a beginning, an entrance into our hearts and our lives. And if we give the devil even the smallest of access, access points, well, before we know it, he's moved in, taken up residence. You know, the Bible says that let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, because God cannot tempt of evil, neither will he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then lust, when it conceives, bringeth forth sin, and sin, death, is what James tells us. So at Passover time, the Jewish families, because at that time they were to have unleavened bread, so they, they had a lot of ceremonies that they would go through, and so they would, during that Passover time, they would do away with the leaven, they would get it all out of their house, even so much as they would go through with a, you know, a bit of a dust broom and, and, a, and, a, and a regular broom, and they would sweep the house to make certain there were no traces of leaven in the house. Now, the Lord's point is pretty obvious as he's trying to get to his disciples, is that we are to be on guard for Satan's efforts and our proneness to sin. But in this particular verse, he addresses what he's already identified, and that's the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. You see, they made great claims of righteousness, but they were insincere and they were wicked in their heart. And so the Lord is, is sounding the alarm to his disciples, watch out. It's easy for us to fall into this routine of, of keeping up the appearances of what is right. We, we sort of know the drill. We know what believers are supposed to do and how we act. And we get involved in that rather than having a pure heart inside. To be authentic and genuine inside and out should be our desire. That's what integrity is. Integrity is that what you present on the outside is what you actually are on the inside. And in these last days, perilous times, the Bible tells us, you know what? We need to be the real thing, real Christians. And so he begins, beware of the leaven. Don't, don't become like the Pharisees and understand how it begins so small and creeps in. We must be constantly on guard. And then he talks about revealed, verse 2. For there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. This is a very sobering truth. Very sobering truth. Think of all your secrets. So I don't have any secrets. Yes, you do. The sin, the liberties that you have given yourself. You know what God says? God says, everything that you've covered is going to be uncovered. Everything that you think that you've been able to hide away. He said, it's going to be out. The things that you've said in, in private, they'll be proclaimed upon the housetops. Now, let's, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First, First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. So the hidden things of darkness are brought into the light and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Our motivation, why we do what we do, and then shall every man have praise of God. It is at that time that everything that we sort of have set before others is going to be brought to light. Now, in chapter 3, a great chapter talks about the judgment seat of Christ, but it talks about every man's, verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
Now, I know what happens. You think about that, you say, okay, pastor, I know this. I know that one day, as a Christian, I'm going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and everything that I've done in my body from the time I get saved till the time I die or until the time that Jesus comes, everything that I've done will be judged before God. I'm building upon that foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ, and I might be building with wood, hay, stubble. Well, that's not really good stuff. That's going to probably get burned up. Or I'm going to be building with gold, silver, and precious stone. That's going to be refined and purified in that fire. And at the end result of that is whether we get rewards or not. So we automatically say, wow, that's good. But you know what? I'm not convinced that that's only what the Lord's talking about in Luke chapter 12. I don't know that he was talking just about the coming day of judgment. But maybe he was addressing the fact that God knows everything right here and right now. And that oftentimes God chooses to bring to light our sin right now. See, the book of Numbers tells us, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes series, used to tell a story of a telegram that he supposedly sent to 12 men, 12 friends, all men of great virtue, great reputation, Men of position in society, held in high esteem. And the telegram simply said this. Fly at once. All is discovered. Fly at once. Now, that's not on an airplane. This was a long time ago, but it means to flee. Flee at once. All is discovered. Within 24 hours, Doyle said, all 12 had left the country. Now, looking back, we understand that he did not actually do that, but it message every time he told the story, it seemed there were an awful lot of uneasy smiles and chuckles. You know, down through the years, I've often seen the Lord work in mysterious ways to bring out that all may know the hidden sin. And I got to tell you, it's always a painful and humiliating experience. And it is only if we will truly repent and confess that God can somehow take that experience and bring some good from it. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Well, let's look at verse 4. And I want you to consider fear God. And I say unto you, my friends... Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will forewarn you to whom ye shall fear. Fear him after, which after, excuse me, he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now, no doubt these disciples were concerned, very concerned about the Pharisees. You see, the, the Pharisees, the religious establishment, had tremendous power and influence, and yes, they could even orchestrate your death. And they were definitely men to be feared. Now, when I read this text, I'm, I'm reminded of those young Hebrew captives, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and how they had determined when they were in the land of Babylon under captivity, how they determined that they would not bow down or worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had built. I'll not have you turn there, but Daniel chapter 3 says, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 17 to me is always an amazing statement. They said, here's what we understand. We understand that our God is able to deliver us from this death that you have orchestrated for us in that burning, fiery furnace. But they said, we also know that God will deliver us out of your hand. Nebuchadnezzar, maybe you can take our body's life. 
But the reality is you can't touch us after that. Hmm. You know, there is a rising evil in this world, and frankly, it's not going away. And this evil is exerting tremendous pressure upon governments, upon social attitudes, upon the media to silence the voices of God's truth in schools, in public places, in discourse, in the workplace, you name it, we've all seen it. And the question is whether or not you and I will be silent when it comes our turn to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. Do we fear men or do we fear God? Now the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God in his word. And it springs forth from within us as we know God with a, a genuine love for God's divine character. And the problem is, is that the whole concept of an, an awe of God has basically been shown the door in most churches today. One man put it this way. I thought it was interesting. He said, awe has been replaced by feeling good about myself from a God that has a happy face. Our view of God has changed dramatically. The warning that Jesus gives here is to embrace an eternal view, to look beyond the scary days of wicked men and recognize that God's still on the throne, God is still sovereign, God will reign, and one day God will make all things new. So we need to give God the honor and the reverence of which he alone is worthy. And Jesus said, you know what? Here's who you should be reverencing. Here is who you should be fearing. Here is who you should be get, uh, concerned about. Not just those that maybe can uh, take you to the stake or stone you to death, but fear the one who has eternal judgment in mind. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, moving on to verse 6. I want you to notice something that we are not forgotten. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Wow, the Lord uh, takes this picture of fearing God and the awesomeness and his power throughout all eternity, his power to judge us, and he turns to a brief illustration about little birds, sparrows. Really insignificant. Um, really the poorest of the poor. I mean, some would even try to catch them and sell them, and they could only get two farthings for them. And this God, in his infinite knowledge of all things, says, you know what? Even those tiny sparrows, I see them. I know what's happening with them. I certainly know what's happening with you. You ever stop? I, we live such busy lives. Go, 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 go. We never take time to sit down at all. And now that the warm weather has come, we've finally been able to go and sit on our back porch, sometimes just for a half hour or so in the evening, and we like sitting there, and we watch the sparrows. And when they flit, well, and the crows too. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> but God sees the crows too. <laughs> but when you look at those little ones and they come and they maybe sit on a wire near you or on a little branch or something and you think, you know what, God, God takes note of them. God knows what's going on in their lives. I mean, that, that infinite knowledge is hard for you and I to grasp. And then he talks about what? He says that he knows what? The very hairs on our head are all numbered. Now, we often joke about that. I usually tell you how mine's easier to count than yours, you know. But you know what? It reveals the intimate knowledge of God. He knows things about us that it's impossible for us to know. You don't know how much hair you have. You don't know how many individual hairs there are. But God knows each one. And when you think about that, it amazes me that why would God even concern himself with that? It is because of his great love for us. And he cares for us. We read Psalm 139, and the, the psalmist talks about it. And finally, he finished that verse 7. I think it's verse 6. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't take it in. 
I can't imagine. Why would it be that God knows my down city, my uprising? He knows my good days, my bad days. He knows where I'm at. I can't, there's nowhere I can go where God isn't there. He is always with me. If I'm saved, the Spirit of God dwells within me. So there's no take. I, everything I see, everything I do, everything I experience, God is there with me. And the psalmist says, you know what? That boggles my mind. I can't. Wow, it's too wonderful for me. You know, in the context of facing difficult days and rising opposition to the things of God, we must not lose sight of God's ever-present scene of every detail of our lives. God sees us. God sees you in those scary and threatening environments, and he knows us, and he cares for us, and he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Verse 8. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Whosoever shall confess me before men. We must not be ashamed to let people see and hear that we believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that we serve the Lord and love Him and care more for him than we care for the applause of this earth. We are to confess Jesus Christ before men. Now, i got to tell you something. I do not think that coming to church is much of a public confession of Christ. This is a place where we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a place where we come to, uh, to sing praise to the Lord. This is a place that we come to be uh, taught from the Word of God. Confessing Christ happens out there. At work, in your neighborhood, before your family, your friends, your neighbors, at school, before those that you meet day by day. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, that I must stand on a street corner and preach, though it might be called to do that. Confessing Christ doesn't need brashness or boasting. It needs nothing more than to take hold of a daily opportunity to say, you know what? I love Jesus Christ. You see, if you and I really love him, then we ought not to be ashamed to let people know that. Amen. I've been doing some premarital counseling with Mark and Michelle. And uh, I caught Mark, not Michelle. She was pretty good. But I get them, I give them a little assignment, and I, I ask them to write down 10 reasons why they want to marry this person. And so they bring it back. Mark missed this. Because I was looking for the most important thing. You know what? I'm, oh, I shouldn't tell that now. Anybody else? Oh, these guys are forget it by that time, so. You know what I'm looking for? You know what's the top of the list? Because I love her with all my heart. That's, that ought to be the number one reason. You know what I get? Well, she's nice looking. <laughs> she's talented. We're compatible. All those things are nice, but, you know, you're, you're not doing a you know, uh, an employment interview. <laughs> you know, when we're in love, we don't mind telling people we're in love. We don't mind telling people, this is the one that I love. Why not tell others about Jesus then?
The challenge of confessing Christ is undoubtedly great. In our current social climate, it's going to bring laughter and ridicule, contempt, mockery, scorn, rejection, and worse. But you know, God's not promised us an easy road if we're obedient to proclaiming his truth and our love for him. You know, verse 9 is really rather startling. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And I, I thought, could it be that a continual unwillingness to confess Christ maybe reveals that I've not truly trusted Christ as my Savior? A number of weeks ago in, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus said in verse 26, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But what a tragic thought. Even for a believer to stand before that judgment seat of Christ and, and when the Lord says, come up hither and, and to know that I'm going to stand there, I'm going to receive no crown, receive no rewards, only to hear the Lord speak with great sorrow because I've had a cowardly spirit and but unwilling to own up to him and confess him. Verse 10 says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now, this verse is often misunderstood. What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? We saw it back in chapter 11. Chapter 11 and verse 14, we saw a perfect example. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, the mute man spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. The simple fact was they attributed the mighty working of God, the Holy Spirit, to the devil. And Jesus said there's no forgiveness of that. It's not so much the matter of using blasphemous language, but that it revealed a, a, a determined, persistent, wicked rejection of the Holy Spirit's work. It's a setting of my mind against the Spirit of God. And it's, by the way, it's not possible for a believer to commit such a sin. Now let's go to verse 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. That's God's promise. They say, did that day actually come upon the disciples of the Lord? Oh, yes. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. The book of Acts chapter number 4. We're almost done here. Peter, James, and John were brought before the rulers, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, all kinds of high priestly type people were there. And they judged them and they challenged them by what power, but what name have you done this? And Peter, verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. You see that? That's God's promise. They're called before the magistrates. They're there in court, and it comes time, and then Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and what? God tells him what to say. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they, <coughs> excuse me, had been with Jesus. Look at verse 18. And they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorify God for that which was done. Hmm. God's promise was fulfilled. Remember when we read in Daniel those words? They began by saying to Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you about this. What do they mean? We don't have to think about it. We don't have to talk about it. We don't have to get together and sort of, you know, put together our speech. What are we going to say or what are we going to do? What's the best argument? We don't need lawyers. We don't need anything. They said, we don't have to do any of that because our hearts are already settled. 
We know what God's word says. We're not going to waver from that. God says we're not to have any other God before him, and we're not going to change. So Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful. We don't need to discuss this. And so they could speak with confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it really is a comfort to know that no matter how the waters might rise about me or the flames threaten me, as we saw a couple of weeks ago from Isaiah 43, my God has promised to go with me through those trials. Hmm. You know, as we see the changing times, the shifting values, the rise of wickedness and hatred toward God, God still promises us. I'm going to be there with you. And when you are challenged, don't fret, just trust me. I was reading uh, this week in 2 Timothy, and I'd like to invite you, yeah, 2 Timothy. Would you turn there with me? Well, I'm almost done. Second Timothy chapter 1. Verse 6, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. God hasn't given you and I the spirit of fear. You see, the disciples that Jesus was addressing on that particular day were fearful because of the Pharisees. They were a controlling influence in their society. They had a lot of clout, a lot of say. And they obviously were now rising up against the Messiah and against the Savior of the world. And so the people that were following Jesus were getting quite concerned about it. They didn't know how this is all going to turn out. And so the Lord challenges them about several areas. And we'll review that in just a moment. But he said, I want you to know, the fear doesn't come from me. And God hasn't given you and I a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, a clear thinking. And so he says, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. You know, the Lord Jesus was a teacher and he taught and taught right up to the cross And he continues through the divine record that we have, through his eternal word, to teach this generation, this evil generation, and our generation as believers. And he says, this is what you need if you're going to stand for me. Integrity. Are you the genuine thing? You know, are you what you have presented to us this morning? He said, you need to understand that all is going to be revealed. Be sure your sin will find you out. There's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and it's sobering truth. He that covereth his sins, Proverbs tells us, shall not prosper. But he that forsakes them and confesses them shall have mercy. As long as you're covering up, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to have God's peace. You're never going to have his forgiveness. Fear God. Don't let your fear of people or society control your life. Instead, keep Christ as your focus. And say, you know what? I want to serve him. We're not forgotten. (laughs) Not forgotten. What a wonderful reality. Never a moment of time that God isn't seeing you. It was Hagar. Remember, she was cast out. She was in bitterness and great distress. And she said, thou God seest me. God sees you. He sees me at all times. Confess Christ. You know, Philippians tells us that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. 
God says, you know what? By the way that you live and by your relationship with me, even though you're in the midst of this crooked and perverse nation, even though you are living in this evil generation right now, God says you are to shine as lights, not cover it up. You're to let that light shine. You are to confess Christ. You're to be bold about him. And he said, you know, when you do, then I will announce, hey, here's one of mine before all the angels. You know, it's as we readily identify with our Savior by our lives and the way we live and our words and our example that we bear witness of him. He is the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And God's promise says, don't worry about things. I'll be with you. I'll help you know what to say when that time comes. And he will never leave us nor forsake us.